Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. Welcome back to Fuck That. This week, I am going to be covering a case that happened in Connecticut, and it is actually the first case in Connecticut where a person was tried for murder without there being a body. This case has another name. I'm not going to refer to it as that because I feel like it's really shitty, but it is also known as the Woodchipper case. And yes, that is where the Cohen brothers drew inspiration for the movie Fargo. With that being said, obviously, This episode is going to be a little bit rougher than others, so keep that in mind when listening. In the quiet town of Newtown, Connecticut, nestled in the picturesque landscapes of Fairfield County, which is one of the richest counties in the country, by the way, big money, a gruesome and shocking crime unfolded that would capture the nation's attention. The murder of Heli Crafts, a Danish flight attendant, in November of 1986, brought about the first murder conviction in the state of Connecticut in which a body was never technically found. Heli Crafts, born Heli Lork Nielsen in, okay, so this is in Denmark. I'm going to butcher it, but just know if you're in Denmark and you're listening to this, I listened to the pronunciation and I wrote down how it sounds in my head. So I'm going to make an attempt here. If I butchered it, I'm so sorry. Okay. Born in Charlotte in Lund, Denmark. God, that was so bad. That was so terrible. I tried. On July 7th, 1947, and Heli was a beautiful and independent woman who lived the life of a globetrotting flight attendant. Heli was vivacious and she had a zest for adventure, and this is what drew people to her, and she was known to charm her way into the hearts of anybody that she met. Heli grew up as an only child, and she was well-loved back then as she was as an adult. She easily made friends during her childhood, and this was a trait that she carried into adulthood. One of Heli's many talents was her aptitude for learning languages with ease. During her teenage years, this is insane. In addition to her native language, Heli became fluent in English and French, and on top of that, she was able to completely understand Norwegian, German, and Swedish. After graduating high school, Heli ventured to England to attend college, and following her time in the United Kingdom, she began an adventure as a nanny in France. While Heli was in France, she ended up getting a job working as a flight attendant with Capital Airways. Heli loved to travel, and she considered each destination a new adventure. After Heli learned that Pan Am Airways was looking for a flight attendant in Copenhagen, Heli jumped at the opportunity. So. The Pan Am thing, just quick sidebar. I don't know if any of you watch Roni, Real Housewives of New York. I had no idea what the fuck Pan Am was when Sonia was talking about it. She was like, yeah, Pan Am, Pan Am. And then when I was doing the research for this episode, I was like, holy shit, she was talking about this airway. For somebody that is not a rich housewife that lives in New York, I compare things to Real Housewives of New York way too often. But anyway. Back to the episode. So Heli was like, I'm going to apply. This is something I want to do. And out of 200 candidates, only eight were selected. And obviously, one of them was Heli. Heli traveled to Miami for training for her new role. And on May 24th, 1969, while Heli was awaiting a flight, she met 31-year-old pilot Richard Crafts. Richard I'm a Dickhead Crafts was born in New York City on December 20th, 1937, and was one of three children. His father, John, was a successful businessman, and the family was well off. They ended up relocating to Darien, Connecticut. Okay, if you don't know anything about Connecticut, Darien is where all of the rich people live. I mean, the kind of money where it is like fuck you money. They probably have at least one. I'd say between one to 10 elevators in their house, maybe a helicopter landing pad on their roof. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but Darien is a sincerely, insanely fucking wealthy area. So the family relocated to Darien, and the reasoning behind this is that John, the father, really just wanted to have a more quiet suburban life. 
John had a very impressive career. He was a World War I pilot, and Richard obviously looked up to his father and desperately wanted to follow in his footsteps and make him proud. But unfortunately for John, his son Richard was just a giant disappointment. Now, he did end up doing one or two cool things in his life, which I'll get into, but for the most part, he just is a giant disappointment, and he does horrible things. I got sidetracked from my notes, but I love this line I wrote. (laughs) Unfortunately, Richard was unremarkable. (laughs) Oh, I cracked myself up. All right, so he graduated from Darien High School without distinction and eventually dropped out of college. It happens. Unclear of the path he was meant to take in life, he decided to join the Marines in 1956. Now, this is obviously a respectable and commendable choice. And when he was in the Marines, he focused on aviation, again, following in his father's footsteps. He became a certified pilot and served in Korea and Japan. Richard flew for Air America, which is a branch under the CIA, and that involved him piloting aircrafts on a series of clandestine missions across Southeast Asia, which encompassed assignments in places like Laos and Vietnam. For several years, Richard found himself stationed in the East, flying for Air America until he returned to the States in 1966. Obviously, based on his background, Richard didn't have any trouble at all finding employment as a pilot when he returned back to the United States. And over the next few years, he navigated the skies for various aviation outfits. But by 1968, he secured a very coveted position as a pilot with Eastern Airlines, which at the time was one of the largest and busiest carriers in the country. And this marked a significant turning point in Richard's life as he began earning a very comfortable salary for the first time. Despite his demanding career as a pilot, Richard maintained a very active social life with the ladies. Now, Richard was considered to be an average, regular-looking guy and not what many would expect when considering the stereotypical handsome pilot type. He was 5'8". Nothing wrong with that, but for some reason, some of us ladies are not very nice to men when it comes to their height. I'm sorry, ladies. I love you, but we are. We're not nice to men that aren't six feet tall and up for some reason. We got to stop that. It's mean. Richard was 5'8", and he was just he was just a regular dude. But women were drawn to him because the man had charisma. He had oomph. But when I say oomph, I'm really, I'm not using it nicely. Uh, this means that he was a ladies' man, that women were drawn to him, and those that knew him never saw him without a woman at his side. And Richard was known to specifically only date flight attendants, and he used his stories, some of them fabricated or made to be much more dramatic, from his experiences with Air America to reel them in. And that's gross. Don't do that. Just be your fucking self. So in 1969, when he crossed paths with Heli, he was already engaged to another woman at the time. But I'm not sure if Heli didn't know this, or if he was deceitful about it, or if she knew and was okay with it. A lot of different sources say a lot of different things, but at the end of the day, this is a murder case, and that is something that I feel is irrelevant in the fact that she was murdered. So just letting you know, I couldn't confirm which, but I do know that Richard was engaged when he met Heli. Richard and Heli had a very strong relationship, but it quickly became on and off again, and that persisted for several years. They were frequently engaging in passionate arguments. A lot of times this happened in public settings, but inexplicably, Heli found herself drawn back to Richard time and time again. Heli's friends observed the tumultuous dynamics between the two, and they were skeptical and obviously concerned. They were really confused as to why Heli, who was strikingly beautiful and magnetic, would continue to remain entangled when it was evident that she could be with probably anybody that she wanted. Before I dive deeper into their relationship, I do just want to say this is something that I've covered on the podcast a lot. I'm sorry, it's something I'm never going to stop talking about because domestic violence is something that's a very important topic to me, and I hope if there's anything I can do with this podcast, one of those things would be to educate people on domestic violence. It's easy for people like Heli's friends who meant well and were like, Heli, you could be with anyone you wanted. Very innocent. It's also easy for people to look at domestic violence relationships from the outside and say, oh, why didn't they leave? It's really complicated. It's not that easy. Domestic abuse doesn't just start from the get-go. 
There are cycles, manipulation, and there's trauma bonding that can oftentimes mimic what happens to the brain when there is an addiction to a substance like an opioid. And I know that sounds crazy. I'm not going to get too much into the weeds with this because I don't want to get off track, but it's true. So the push and pull between giving somebody love bombing and then discarding, it creates this weird cycle of hormone release to the point where the reward system, so the dopamine, is quite literally being withheld and only released when there is that love bombing again after the discarding. So I don't want to get too much into the science of it, but it's true. People that are caught in this abuse cycle typically have high levels of cortisol at a baseline, which is it's stress. And then they are waiting, anxiously waiting for the love bombing and that brief honeymoon phase period where everything is okay. And then that's when the dopamine releases. So it's it's really complicated. It's really fucked up. Just keep that in mind when you're listening to this episode, because a lot of things that I read about this case is, well, why didn't she leave? And it's it's just never the question to ask when somebody is being abused. And now I'm going to segue into the start of their abuse, and it's rough, so listen with care. Now, when Heli was with Richard, she initially believed that she couldn't have children, and when she became pregnant, she was pleasantly surprised. Richard, however, was furious at the news of her pregnancy, and Richard hit Heli in response to this and ended up pushing her into getting an abortion. Heli became pregnant again in November of 1975, and she was anticipating his reaction. Let's be serious. She was pregnant, and she was hit for it, so she scheduled an abortion out of fear. But then... In true dirtbag fashion, Richard was like, huh, I actually do want to have a child. Let's do it. Helly and Richard wed a few days later in New Hampshire. The following year, the newlyweds purchased a one-story ranch in Newtown, and the couple ended up having three children together over the next few years. Heli continued to work as a flight attendant, and she enlisted the help of a 19-year-old nanny to help the pair care for the children. Richard continued his career as an airline pilot, and this obviously required him to often be away from home. Heli and Richard were an incredibly successful couple financially, and they were doing well. However, Richard managed the family's finances. And while Hallie and Richard's marriage seemed like a fairy tale, beneath the surface, trouble was brewing. Maintaining control of the finances for Richard meant that he could spend the couple's money however he saw fit. Even though Hallie made about one-third of what Richard made, Hallie was responsible for every single household expense, while he was then able to freely spend the rest of their money on whatever the fuck he wanted. Richard came into the marriage with an impressive arsenal of weapons that he purchased while he was single. And after they purchased their home, Richard was like, oh shit, this is an opportunity to expand my collection as if I am a real life Call of Duty character. And his collection included several shotguns, numerous handguns, including 9mm autos, 44 caliber revolvers, 357 magnums, and several high powered rifles, which, by the way, Connecticut, that's really not a thing anymore. Because unfortunately, this is the state where Sandy Hook occurred. But this happened in the 80s, so different times. I just realized I wasn't done with that list. Sorry. So going back to the rifles, he also had several semi-auto firearms, crossbows. This is weird to me. Hand grenades. Like, what the fuck are you going to do with those? Like, what are you doing with hand grenades? I Like, I don't, to each his own, I guess. And thousands of rounds of ammunition. To my knowledge, Richard did not believe in zombies and was not preparing for a potential zombie apocalypse. So this is, you know, this is something that gave Heli pause. But this is what Richard was into, and he devoted every single free hour that he had each week, and there there weren't many, not to his family, but to maintaining and expanding his collection. And he also frequently attended gun shows in Connecticut and New Jersey, ultimately to acquire more. But Richard's insane spending really went beyond the weapons and ammo. It also included the purchase of, and this is just so weird and I don't understand it, but a lot of landscaping equipment, tractors, lawnmowers, 
and a $25,000 backhoe that Richard never used. If you're wondering what a backhoe is, I too had the same question when I was doing my research, and it's just like one of those big diggers. You'd see it if somebody's trying to excavate something. It's probably the most cliche toy that Tonka makes, you know, those little yellow diggers. So he bought one of those for $25,000 almost 40 years ago that he never used. That is an insane amount of money. So their front yard became insanely cluttered, and this angered their neighbors. They lived in a nice area, and they didn't want to look at that shit. I can't blame them. I wouldn't want to look at it either. It would be bizarre and concerning to me, so I understand. So fast forward to 1982, Richard is juggling his very demanding piloting job at Eastern Airlines. He has a house that's in constant need of repairs. Richard decides that he's going to join the Newtown Police Department as an unpaid auxiliary officer. And this was a role that he took seriously. And he would often linger at the station during his off hours. And he was known to respond to calls without official authorization. By 1986, Richard landed a paid police officer job in Southbury. So he left his piloting job where he was making way more. And when he took the job, He was hired on at $7 an hour, which is about $19 an hour today. Now, there's nothing wrong with somebody that makes $19 an hour. However, as a man in Connecticut with a wife and three kids, it was a little bit concerning to Helly and everyone that knew them that he would just quit that job where he was able to help and provide for the family to make a fraction of what he made as a cop. As if the pay cut wasn't enough, he then made the decision to invest the family's money that they had saved into attending expensive police training seminars. And this is so corny. I just, I I can't with this man. He purchased a 1985 Ford Crown Vic, which is similar to those that were used by the Connecticut State Police at the time. And he decided to soup it up. He wanted to pimp his ride with multiple radios, antennas, police lights, and a siren. And he did this with his own money. I just, If Richard wasn't 10,000 years old today, like if social media existed when he became a cop, he would be one of those cops that wasn't discreet about their job because they're smart. He would be one of those guys that had blue line something in every single social media handle that he had. I just like that would be him. He'd have one of those back the blue bumper stickers and the back the blue, like the live strong bracelets. He'd have at least 10,000 of those, undoubtedly. So it's obvious that Richard is all over the place, not only emotionally, but in terms of his life altogether. And throughout his 11-year marriage with Helly, which was from 1975 to 1986 when he murdered her, Richard had multiple affairs with numerous women. Helly's marriage to Richard was deteriorating. She was over it, and she began to openly discuss divorce with friends. In the summer of 1986, Helly took action and she hired a divorce attorney. Helly also hired a man named Keith Mayo, who was a former Connecticut cop turned private investigator to gather evidence against Richard. A month prior to her disappearance, Keith showed Helly photos of Richard with another flight attendant that he was having an affair with for at least a decade. For those that knew Richard or for those that knew Helly and Richard together as a couple, Almost every single person described Richard as cold and detached. Richard had issues with alcohol consumption and spent most of his time at home in the basement, ignoring Helly and their children. Richard was verbally and physically abusive to Helly, and she was seen numerous times by many different people with bruises, including bruises on her face. Richard was very cunning in his marriage to Helly and went through great lengths to conceal everything he was hiding from her. And that involved keeping a private P.O. box to conceal his affairs and having their phone bills sent to that private P.O. box so that she couldn't see. So back in the day when you had a house phone, I don't ever check my cell phone bill. This is probably a thing on the cell phone bill. There's kind of an itemized list of phone calls. So he didn't want Helly to see that and look at him calling the same number or receiving phone calls from the same number. So he had it sent to a private P.O. box. Richard was also an incredibly manipulative person. I couldn't find an exact timeline on these events, but 
I read somewhere between one to two years prior to Hallie's disappearance, Richard was diagnosed with colon cancer. He ended up going through surgery and chemo and he was fine. But when Hallie was getting ready to file for divorce and this became abundantly clear to Richard, he ended up telling her that he was dying and he was going to abandon treatment. Hallie found out that this was a lie and a manipulation tactic after she called his doctor. Again, like I said before, Richard completed his treatment and was fine. On October 14th of 1986, after Helly received those photos uncovering his affair from Keith Mayo, the PI that she hired, she contacted her divorce attorney to officially begin proceedings. Helly tried to remain civil and she told Richard that she would allow him to stay in the house with the family until the divorce proceedings were over. Her one stipulation was that she did not want him to see his girlfriend during that time. He was obviously free to do whatever he wanted after the divorce. That was just the one thing that she requested from him. Helly had arranged to have divorce papers served on November 14th while their children were at school. And she told Richard about this. And Richard said that he would accept the papers. But instead, when the process server came knocking on the door, Richard bolted out of the back door. Richard was not going to accept or sign those divorce papers because he had other plans for Helly. According to the Center for Relationship Abuse Awareness, Education, and Action, the most dangerous time for a partner experiencing domestic violence is when they leave the abusive partner. 75% of domestic violence-related homicides occur during separation, and there is a 75% increase of violence upon separation for at least two years after. On November 18th of 1986, Central Connecticut was hit by a severe winter storm. Snow and sleet covered the region, creating impossible driving conditions and several power outages. In Southbury, utility worker Joseph Hine began his night shift at 11.30 p.m., spreading sand and plowing roads due to the heavy snowfall. Around 3.30 in the morning, while plowing along River Road, which is a pretty remote road where you don't typically see people from the general public driving along, Joseph encountered a parked U-Haul van with a wood chipper that was attached to its back. The van's lights were off and the rear door was closed. A man near the driver's door signaled for him to pass, so he thought nothing of it and continued along his route. But... Two hours later, at 5.30 a.m., he returned to River Road and saw the same U-Haul with the wood chipper. But this time, the rear door was open and there were wood chips inside. At this point, Joseph paused and he thought it was really weird that somebody would be operating a wood chipper in the middle of a blizzard. But Joseph continued his work and he watched the U-Haul fade in the distance from his rearview mirror. Now, the night of that storm, which was a Wednesday, Helly returned home from a work flight from Frankfurt. A friend dropped Helly off at home, and as the friend watched Helly walk into her home, that was the last time that anybody saw Helly alive, except for her husband, Richard. At 6 a.m. the next day, Richard rushed the three children and their nanny out of the home. He said that he was going to take them to his sister's house in Westport since they didn't have any power and he told the nanny and their children that Helly had already left for his sister's house and that she would meet them there. But Helly never arrived at his sister's home, and Helly was never seen or heard from again. And as news spread about Helly's disappearance, Helly's co-workers and friends were all in agreement that Helly was a devoted mother who wouldn't just up and leave her children. And after Helly had not returned home for a couple of days, they told investigators about Richard's ongoing abuse and multiple affairs. Police also learned that Richard had many different versions of what happened to his wife, Helly, the last night that she was seen. Richard told the neighbor that Helly had made a trip to Germany and would be returning home soon. He told other people that he wasn't sure where Helly went. Two days after her disappearance, He told the nanny that Helly had to fly to Denmark because her mother was ill and that she would be back on the 24th. But Helly's mother was fine and she had not seen or heard from Helly either. It was actually one of Helly's friends who ended up getting Helly's mother's phone number in Denmark and she called her to check up on her and Helly. But Helly's mother told her that she was in good health and that she wasn't anticipating seeing Helly until the following spring. 
This really upset Helly's friend, so she took this information to the police, and she said that she spoke to Helly earlier in the month, and Helly told her that, quote, if anything happens to me, don't assume it was an accident. December 1st, 1986, the Newtown Police Department received a phone call from Keith Mayo, Helly's investigator, and Keith told police that his client, Helly, had recently disappeared and he was afraid that her husband, Richard, probably murdered her. He insisted that the police begin to investigate this disappearance immediately. I think immediately, right off the bat, one of the biggest problems with this disappearance and investigation is that Newtown detectives obviously knew Richard very well because he was an auxiliary police officer in their department before. When investigators interviewed Richard on December 2nd, he had confirmed the story that he has been sticking to this whole time, stating that the night before Helly disappeared, she was happy. She showed no signs of being different or upset. He and his wife slept at home, and when they awoke the next morning, Richard said that the plan was Helly was going to go to his sister's house in Westport. He was going to meet her there with the children and the nanny. However. Helly never showed. Richard insisted that he had not seen or heard from Helly since their last conversation and encounter prior to her allegedly leaving for his sisters, and initially the police did not express concern over Helly's disappearance. Newtown police assumed that Helly's disappearance was like most others, and most disappearances aren't actually like this, but I digress. They assumed that Helly was an upset spouse she needed some space to cool down, and that she would return home safely after she calmed down. But that sentiment quickly changed once investigators began interviewing those close to Helly. When Richard spoke to detectives, he ended up taking and passing a lie detector test, and the lieutenant in charge of investigation at Newtown at the time considered that enough to clear him. Detectives ended up interviewing the nanny who told investigators that Richard abruptly woke her up at 6 a.m. on the 19th and said that Helly's sister was driving to his sister's house in Westport and that they would join her later to wait out the power outage. Like I had mentioned before, he did end up bringing the children and the nanny there, but what is strange is that he left immediately after dropping them off and he didn't return to his sister's house until 7 p.m. that evening. When the nanny asked about Helly, he initially said he had no idea where she was. Later, when she asked again because she was concerned, he claimed that she was in Denmark with her sick mother, which we know is not true. The nanny also told investigators that she had noticed missing carpet pieces in the master bedroom, and she said that this was where she noticed a dark stain. And Richard had told her that this was due to a kerosene spill. I mean, you can't kerosene in the master bedroom. This dude is supposed to be a fucking pilot. He's obviously intelligent. That is that is what you came up with. A fucking kerosene spill in the master bedroom. What is this? The 16 fucking hundreds? I know there's a power outage, but what are you fucking operating 15 different lanterns that are fueled by kerosene and well blubber? Do you carry those lanterns to your outhouse? Anyway, so he took and passed that lie detector test on December 4th. And while that lieutenant cleared him, There were some detectives that remained skeptical considering basically the interviews that they had with people, the nanny, and there were some that thought that it was really unusual that Richard would go from being a pilot to a cop, and there were some detectives that just thought it was bizarre, but while his behavior was questionable, there was no direct evidence of him doing anything wrong. So detectives decided to try to conduct another interview with Richard. This interview occurred on December 11th, and this was when he was on duty at the Southbury Police Department, which is where he was working the night shift. Newtown cops were like, yo, Southbury, send him over. So they did. And according to police reports, this is how the interview progressed. I'm not going to read it line for line because it's a lot, but they asked if he knew that Helly had hired a PI. He said no. Did you know that the PI has documented your relationship with that lady? No. Why would your wife tell her friends she was afraid for herself regarding serving you divorce papers and tell them to check on her if something happened? To which he replied, I cannot imagine her saying this. It is completely out of character for her to say this. 
They asked questions about when and why Hallie left on the 18th, and he said, those answers are in my statement. They asked about the bedroom rug, and he said that all of the rugs in the house are being removed and replaced, and said that kerosene was what was spilled. They asked if he cut the pieces out. He said, yeah, two feet at a time. It's easier to remove it that way. They asked him what he did with the rug that he took out of the bedroom, and he said he dumped the bedroom rug in the Newtown landfill one week ago. It was blue in color. They asked, why have you been telling everyone different things about Heli being missing, like her mother being sick? He said, I didn't want to say my wife was gone, and I did not know where she was. Has Heli received any mail since she has gone missing? He said, no, she has gotten no letters since she left, and she usually gets about two letters a week, which is, that is very strange to me. Why would she suddenly stop receiving mail? It takes time, hypothetically, let's say that she forwarded to another address. That takes time. It doesn't just process right away. I guess you could argue that she had planned to disappear, but come on. By Christmas, police obtained a search warrant for the Crafts home, and this uncovered many clues. They found pieces of missing carpet from the home and the bedroom floor, which had been removed. There was a blood smear that was discovered on the side of the bed, so obviously his kerosene bullshit didn't, it didn't add up. What was really alarming to investigators was that Richard's credit card records had showed that he had made several suspicious purchases prior to Heli disappearing, which included a new freezer. And when they searched the home on Christmas, that freezer was not located in the home. He purchased new bed linens and a comforter, which he purchased on the 19th. That was the day that he took the kids and the nanny to his sister's house. They also discovered that he had spent $900 on a rental fee for a wood chipper. Investigators obviously discovered the metric fuck ton of weapons that he had. They seized towels, washcloths, they took fiber samples, and they took the mattress from the master bedroom. And all of this was sent to the state crime lab for processing. And this was run by Dr. Lee. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but there was a luminol test done throughout the house that revealed traces of blood throughout the home, and some of that matched Heli's blood type, which was O positive. But despite the wealth of evidence, the crucial question remained unanswered, and that question is, where was Heli? The investigation began to progress rapidly when Joseph Hines, the snowplow driver I mentioned earlier, came forward to police about what he saw on River Road that night. And this led to an extensive search in that area, which included scanning the icy lake that was off of that road. Joseph led detectives to the area over a month after Heli's disappearance, and amazingly, the debris pile that he saw was still there. And within the debris pile, they found shredded plastic mixed in with wood chips, along with a scrap piece of mail that investigators believed was in Heli's pocket when Richard murdered her. That piece of mail had her name and address on it, which investigators were able to confirm. Investigators were then able to track down the U-Haul and the wood chipper, and they believe that when Richard was seen by Joseph, he was getting ready to return the wood chipper, so he was feeding brush and sticks through it in an effort to try to clear out any remaining evidence of his crime before he brought it back. Investigators were also able to recover fragments of a toe, finger, and bone chips, skull fragments, two dental crowns, and they were able to match Heli's O-positive blood. They also found several strands of blonde hair, which clearly matched Heli's, and they recovered a chainsaw from the Housatonic River that had human tissue and hair attached to the blade and housing tool. Richard made an attempt to etch the serial number off of the chainsaw, but they were able to recover that and figure out the chainsaw's serial and match it to Richard. They matched that $900 charge to a wood chipper, and the specific type of wood chipper was called a brush bandit. But perhaps the most damning purchases that Richard made, which indicated that there was premeditation to his crime, was a purchase that he made on November 13th. And that was the day before he knew he was going to get served divorce papers on the 14th. That was the day that he purchased that large capacity freezer, which they could not find within the home. What was strange about that purchase is he paid for it in cash and refused to leave his name on a receipt for pickup, and he picked it up the day before she disappeared. Even though investigators had compiled a large amount of evidence against Richard, Richard could not be tried for Heli's murder until her official death was recorded by state agencies. 
and this was really complicated by the lack of an identifiable body. Investigators took the crowns that they recovered where they found that brush pile and they brought it to a forensic dentist that was able to match those crowns to Helly's dental records. And the Connecticut State Medical Examiner's Office issued a death certificate for Helly on January 13th of 1987. Richard was arrested immediately after. Based off of what the police were able to uncover, they were able to paint a picture of what they believed happened on the night of November 18th when Heli disappeared. This is going to be graphic, but I'm going to keep it very brief. When Heli returned home from work, Richard likely attacked her in the bedroom between the evening and early morning, which is what left the bloodstains on the carpet, the mattress, etc. Richard then likely placed Heli in the new freezer he purchased in the basement, wrapping Heli in plastic. At some point, he took Heli to a nearby secluded piece of property that he owned, and they believed that this is where he used the chainsaw on this secluded piece of property to cut Heli's body into pieces that he could use in the wood chipper. He then used the wood chipper to scatter Heli's remains along the river and surrounding areas. So really just, I don't know, to be able to do that, yeah. Yeah, I don't have any words. This dude is... I don't know. This dude is a fucking demon. When news came out about this case, obviously it was shocking and this case gained a lot of publicity. So because of that, Richard's trial was moved to New London, Connecticut, and it began in May of 1988. Trial prosecution, which was led by state attorney Walter Flanagan, presented a team of forensic experts, which included Dr. Henry Lee. That's the one that I'm mentioned earlier in the episode during the investigation at the home. And Dr. Lee expressed the significance of these minute bone and tissue fragments that they found at Lake Zor and around the Housatonic. He identified 65 different bone pieces that were cut by a heavy machine, and he said that the bone, human tissue fibers, and hair were all mixed together with wood chips and vegetative debris, but most importantly, that all of this debris was cut by the same machine. Another key piece of evidence was the chainsaw that was recovered from the Housatonic River on December 30th, and this is where they found the hair, tissue, And they also found several blue fibers that were recovered from within the teeth of the blade, and that matched the blue rug inside the home. Even though Richard scratched off the cereal, they were able to uncover the cereal, and that matched a receipt that Richard had at home from January 9th of 1981. And this receipt was actually in police custody as when Heli hired P.I. Keith Mayo, she gave him several boxes of personal belongings and that receipt was one of the receipts in that box. A forensic odontologist testified during trial that human teeth that were recovered from the water, one of which had a fragment attached to jawbone, he confirmed that the teeth were removed from the mouth with traumatic force that sheared it off and took the bone along with it. One of those teeth, which is the one that had the crown compared to Heli's x-ray, was a match. And according to the odontologist, he was medically absolutely certain of the match. The case went to jury on June 23rd of 1988, but ultimately ended in a mistrial after 17 days of deliberation, which was a state record at the time. And this is because a juror refused to continue with deliberations. Something that I discovered that I thought was really interesting was sometime between his arrest and trial, while he was in jail, David had asked his brother-in-law to destroy potential evidence, which included clothing and other items that belonged to Heli and he attempted to do this in burn barrels in the backyard. He also paid two strangers to say that they saw Heli at a party where there was allegedly a shit ton of drug use and alcohol just two days after she disappeared. But during the first trial, those eyewitnesses never appeared. And if you're wondering where that freezer is that he bought, he had his brother-in-law get rid of the freezer while he was in jail. Richard testified on his own behalf like an arrogant fucking dick wart. And when he discussed Helly's seriousness about her divorcing him, he said, quote, my continuous playing around was a sore point, end quote. 
He then went on to insist that he never raised a finger in anger at Helly in his life. Richard testified that the last night they had together was normal. He made dinner for her. Please, this guy never fucking made dinner for her. Let's be serious. They watched TV. He assumed that when she left the next morning, she went to his sister's, but she didn't say where she was going. Richard said, yeah, I rented a wood chipper, but it was to clear brush on the property. And yeah, I bought a freezer, but it was to store food Helly bought in bulk. During the second trial, again, this case had received an overwhelming amount of attention. So the second trial was moved to the Judicial District of Stamford, Norwalk, and the retrial began on September 7th of 1989. During the second trial, the brother-in-law that helped him ended up testifying against him. And he said that Richard told him that divers would never find Helly's body because it's gone. Unlike the first trial, when the jury deliberations began for the second trial on November 20th, it only took eight hours to reach a unanimous verdict. Richard Crafts was found guilty of murder, and the verdict was announced on November 21st, three years and two days since Helly was last seen alive. On January 8th of 1990, Richard Crafts, unapologetic as usual, received a sentence of 50 years in prison for the murder of his wife, Helly. Richard and his attorney appealed due to alleged taped telephone conversations between suspects and their lawyers that were secretly recorded at the state police barracks, and also due to an unfair trial because of the publicity of his case. His lawyers argued insufficient evidence, improper jury instructions, including his wife's statements that she made to friends about worrying about herself, and prejudicial publicity. But thankfully, Connecticut Supreme Court upheld his murder conviction in a four-to-one decision dismissing the claims of an unfair trial. The judge that presided over the trials initially said that, quote, I am concerned that Mr. Crafts has not publicly nor privately demonstrated any remorse for the murder of his wife. Karen, Mr. Crafts' sister, this is the one who they were set to stay with the day following her disappearance, was given custody of the couple's three children. And what I love about her is that she urged the judge during sentencing to impose the maximum sentence. On January 30th of 2020, Richard was released from prison early because of statutory good time and was sent to live at a halfway house in Bridgeport. Richard's maximum release date was August 1st of 2020. Helly Craft's story reminds us that domestic violence is an issue that often remains hidden and shrouded in silence. Stories like Helly's should be a reminder to us that we need to be vigilant against domestic violence and offer support to anybody who may be in an abusive situation. But Helly Crafts was more than just a victim, and she should be remembered as such. Helly was a world traveler. Helly was an avid learner. She was a mother. She was a friend. And she was a beloved member of her community. Rest in peace, Helly. If you liked what you heard today, please like, review, subscribe. You can find me across all social media at fthatpod, except for Instagram, fthat underscore pod. Subscribe to the Patreon for extra content, fthatpod, and don't forget to check out the website, fthatpod.com. <laughs>